Let us stand for our call to worship. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. On this Sunday of Independence Weekend and literally July 4th, this does not happen very often, uh, we, our opening hymn is America the Beautiful and is on the insert in your bulletin. matriarch of the DeGroff family, who was a July 4th baby, correct? Third. July 3rd baby, all right. And shared a birthday with her good friend, um, Joy Bullock's mom, isn't that right? Right. 
So July 3rd, Orlando babies. Uh, so thank you for the beautiful flowers. I'm glad to see the whole family filling up a whole row. That's a good thing today. We uh, have fireworks tonight on the lawn. Some of you had fireworks last night at Lake Raven. Some had fireworks at Lake Burton. Some had fireworks in Highlands and some had fireworks in Sky Valley. Tonight is Dillard's Fireworks and uh, we have a great place to see them from. Although those two trees are concerning me greatly right over there by the driveway. So kind of shift to this end. You want to shift way over, get a clear view. Uh, 7.30. In fact, I saw somebody over on the other side of the streets already put their tent and chairs out. So you can come back and save your spot, put your blanket down, your folding chairs. Uh, Joey and I will uh, get here early. Uh, Cheryl and Pam will be helping us and we're going to make uh, chili and hot dogs and chopped onions. Royce is making coleslaw. Uh, and uh, bring uh, yourself. And if you are an Ingalls valued shopper or whatever their little card is called uh, and you've not already gotten and eaten your free watermelon if you go you get it you you pay it rings up but then with your Ingalls card you get it for free so you can pick up a free watermelon this afternoon and bring it with you we'll have hot dogs chili chips uh, lemonade water and however many lemonade um, watermelons we can eat and uh, fireworks start about 9 15 9 30 and uh, thanks to Louise and the Dillard House for putting that on. It's always a great night, and tonight is going to be perfect, perfect weather. It doesn't get any better than that, so we will look forward to it this evening on the front lawn. It's also sort of our first sort of putting our tip of our toe in the water of eating together. We've not done that in a long time, and uh, we'll be outside, fresh air, all of those things, and besides, I've all seen you at the Dillard House and Clay Cafe. You don't care. You're going to eat wherever the food is. So uh, we'll have it and be uh, as safe as we can. There will be no uh, Bible studies this Tuesday. It's normally uh, Presbyterian women the first Tuesday of the month, but they take July off. And to not get everybody confused, particularly the pastor, uh, we will take this Tuesday off. Our food distribution this month will be on the 17th. Mark your calendars for that. Uh, it is a great day to be here, a couple hours of service, and we uh, provide about 40,000 pounds of food to close to 200 households, about 500 individuals each month. Uh, this year, I can't wait to see our total in retail value of food because we all know the cost of groceries have gone uh, incredibly higher. And uh, last year, I think we did $1.4 million worth of food. So. Uh, it will definitely be a new record uh, for the, the physical year 2020-2021. All the rest of your announcements are in your bulletin. Uh, we uh, have the reservations still open, but we're not really going to use them in July, but we're going to keep it there in case anything changes and we need to, to use it. So uh, you can make reservations or not. We also continue to keep our services online, and it has been amazing uh, how far that has reached and how many people that it has touched. Uh, Mavis shared with me that uh, she was hoping when we started being back together that was one thing I could take off my plate and then she was out in the community and someone followed her back to her car and thanked her for our church doing this because this person works on Sunday and can't go to church and how much it's meant to her to be able to watch our services. So we will continue to be online sometime maybe Monday or Tuesday. This service will be online and uh, all the past ones for the last 18 months. So uh, be sure and share uh, the, the great music and the great sermons with your friends and neighbors. <laughs> as our children come forward for the children's message, and just as a point of reference, I have apple fritters, children, so you may want to come. And uh, we will uh, stand and greet those around us with uh, elbow bump, fist bump, handshake, whatever you're comfortable with.
hand it to Rick, but he left. <laughs> There's one more. It's still warm. What? It's warm. <laughs> you got coffee? <laughs> no, that would be communion. <laughs> That's right. Well, I got apple fritters today because they had just made them, and they were in nice red, white, and blue box. So I try to sort of tie my theme in each and every week so the red, white, and blue box fits with the 4th of July. And with that, I remembered a great old song, which I bet these people all know. It was a commercial. And you know, somehow commercials just stick in your head. You may not be able to remember your wife's birthday, your anniversary, when your first child was born, <laughs> what child number three's name is, <laughs> but a commercial sticks in your head. And there was a commercial years ago that went like this. It went, baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet. Chevrolet. <laughs> Chevrolet. Y'all all drive Ford. You weren't paying attention. <laughs> Baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet. And it was kind of talking about what is America, right? And today with 4th of July, you're probably going to have a hot dog or two at some point today. Maybe some chips, some potato salad, some coleslaw, some baked beans. Maybe a Coke in a glass bottle. And you're going to get to watch fireworks. And all of those are an important part of this special day, but it's really a day that we are to remember our independence as a nation. Do you know the word holiday? We all like a holiday. But a holiday is a contraction of two words, holy day. In the church, we have a lot of holy days, Easter, Christmas, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Ash Wednesday, Pentecost. But in our society, in our culture, we have some holy days also. Fourth of July, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, Labor Day. So today as we celebrate and have fun, remember the great cost that this freedom that we enjoy was bought with by other people who went before us. Can we say a prayer together? Lord, we give you thanks for our freedom that we enjoy, and may we please never take it for granted. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
very little celebration, Lord. It is truly a day that we have looked forward to, a day that we can celebrate really getting back to normal while still being cautious, while still looking at whatever lies ahead with caution, we are bravely moving forward. We are facing our fears. We are triumphing over a dreaded disease that has plagued the country. And we rejoice and give thanks, not only for the scientists in the laboratories, but for the doctors, the nurses, the first responders, the law enforcement who have been on those front lines so long, giving and risking so much. On this day, Lord, we give thanks for our independence as a country and for our dependence as individuals on the love of you and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray these prayers and the many silent prayers on each heart in the wondrous name of Jesus, our liberating Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are continuing in a sort of protocol, COVID protocol, to not do our traditional offering. Uh, but we do have offering, not plates, but buckets at both doors after the service. Uh, all of your numbers for the past three weeks are in the bulletin. Please make a note. Uh, we continue to work on our challenge gift. We are more than halfway toward the $250,000, which we receive. will receive a matching gift. Uh, from an anonymous donor outside of our church, not a church member, uh, to uh, match that. Uh, we also received a designated gift, not toward the challenge, that you will see in the bulletin of $100,000 in the past couple of weeks. So we continue to move forward and excited to uh, be uh, getting ready to break ground and build a new sanctuary, convert this into a fellowship hall, and continue to serve Christ and all that is good in this community for decades to come. Terry now has a beautiful offertory medley for your reflection. <laughs>
blessings, the treasures that you've entrusted to us, and help us to use them to your glory for good and to proclaim the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become servants to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Today is the 4th of July. Hopefully, hopefully, you already have all your shopping done. Hopefully, you did it before Thursday because Friday was wild. It was like a snow day prediction in the mountains. There may not be any single pack of hot dogs left at any of the stores in town. Probably not a bag of chips or certainly not the one you want. All that's probably left is salt and vinegar because nobody really likes salt and vinegar. <laughs> and then there's charcoal, which if you don't have it, you are in trouble, let alone lighter fluid, because I don't think there's a bag left in Raven County. This is the day. This is the day that we as a nation celebrate our freedom, <coughs> our independence with parades and family celebrations and Flying old glory and, yes, of course, fireworks. Fireworks. I still cannot get used to seeing fireworks stands in Georgia. That is just something that I'm not used to. In Georgia, we never had fireworks stands. You made a special trip the moment you were old enough to go to Alabama or South Carolina to get your fireworks. That's what you did. I realized years ago that there's a correlation between a state's ranking in education and the availability of fireworks. <laughs> Therefore, where is Georgia now in that list? The other ranking of education and states is motorcycle helmet laws, but that's a whole other story. It's easy to forget the sacrifice in a moment of celebration. It's easy to forget the sacrifice the risk, the cost of our freedom. That has continued for over 200 years. It was not just the Revolutionary War. It was the War of 1812 and conflicts again and anew around the world where our country has stood for freedom and democracy, not only at home, but abroad. Sparklers, watermelons, streamers, bunting, ball games, a day at the lake or at the beach, all good, but maybe all those things together cloud or, in a better way, candy coat the reality. We have all seen the bumper sticker, freedom isn't free. It is hard to win and it's harder to keep and maintain. Maybe we need to work on our national holiday, and with that, a holiday is simply a word made up of two words, holy day. Our national holy day that we can build in ways to tell the story to our children and grandchildren in a more meaningful way, in a more memorable way. I like to think of Passover and our Jewish brothers and sisters at the Seder meal. They have a way of remembering that is so powerful and wonderful. First, there is food. 
Food is always a great way to build a tradition. Think about the different special meals in your family or when you left home and went away, when you went home, what did you want mom to make? You had a list. You knew what tasted like home, what smelled like home. The Jewish people had this meal at the Passover called the Seder meal. And with that, there is ritual, there is celebration, and there is remembrance. One tradition of those meals is the asking by the youngest child the four questions of the evening. And the question basically is around the question of why is this night different from all others? Why is today different from all others? The questions at the Seder meal that the child asks, and it's always the youngest child. The honor goes to the youngest child because with each generation, you are re retelling and building in the story. So the honor of that night as the youngest child stands at the table or lifts their voice and says, why does this night differ from all other nights? For all um, other nights, we eat either leavened or unleavened bread. Why on this night only unleavened bread? The second question, on all other nights we eat all kinds of herbs. Why on this night do we only eat bitter herbs? On all other nights we need not dip our herbs even once. Why on this night must we dip them twice? And the fourth and final question, on all other nights we eat either sitting up or reclining. Why on this night do we all recline? The answers are then recited in unison by all of the people around the table, and they give a spiritual interpretation, and they build in customs and traditions that are remembered. Chapter 13 of the book of Exodus discusses commemoration of the people of Israel's liberation, their independence from the bondage of Egypt. In verse 14, it says, your child, some translations say son, may later ask you, what is this? What is this? And you must answer them with a show of power. God brought us out of Egypt in the place of slavery. It is their independent story. It is their story from captivity to freedom. It wasn't an easy journey. After all, they didn't have GPS. They kind of disregard the map and the rules that God gave them and they spent 40 years in the wilderness but eventually they got there eventually they made it to the promised land Webster defines freedom in a very simple way maybe one of the simplest definitions in all of the Webster dictionary it says the quality or state of being free our scripture passage today reveals that the Bible has a great deal to say about freedom. And it's not just in this one letter from Paul. It goes back, Psalm 119 says, I will walk about in freedom for I have sought out your precepts. In other words, I will be free because I have followed God's law. Isaiah 61, 1, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from the darkness for prisoners. Jeremiah 34 says, recently you repented and did what is right in my sight. Each of you proclaimed freedom to your own people. You even made a covenant before me in the house that bears my name. Ezekiel 46, if however he makes a gift from his inheritance to one of his servants, the servant may keep it until the year of freedom, and then it will revert to the prince. Luke 4, 18, this is Jesus speaking from his very lips, his, his words to our ears says, and remember, this is just after his time in the wilderness, just after his temptation, just after at the very start of his ministry. Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
Romans 8, 21, from the pen of Paul again, creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. Our passage today talks about freedom that Christ has set us free. And later in Ephesians, we learn that Christ through faith, we may approach God with freedom and with confidence. James writes in his first chapter, verse 25, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. And James, again, who is about doing and not just thinking the right things, James says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives them freedom. Do you ever think about the law giving you freedom? Think about that when you pull on 441. Who's on which side of the road? Why is there a yellow lane, a, a yellow line, a white line? And we know that we need rules in order to be free. Freedom isn't, freedom isn't lawlessness. Freedom isn't anarchy. It isn't a state of disorder due to the absence or non-recognition of authority or other controlling systems. God gave the law. And with that, we are guided how to live freely with one another. The challenge of the law is that it finds us all guilty of one or two or ten or more violations, problems, struggles, broken promises and commitments. <coughs> Jesus comes not to destroy the law, he says, but to fulfill the law. Who can forget the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, You have heard it said by the men of old, Thou shalt not kill, but I say to you. Right there, there's no turning back. Jesus is claiming, truly speaking in the voice of God when he says, I say to you. Later on in a post-Easter world, Paul helps to explain that we are now by the grace of Jesus Christ forgiven, that we are free that we are not free from the law. We now have the freedom to live into the law through the power of our grace. We are a particular congregation. We are a Protestant congregation. We are in the Presbyterian tradition. Our tradition comes from Scotland and the unique branch of Calvinism as brought to Scotland by John Knox. We are Protestant. We are protesters by nature. It is in our blood. God is sovereign. And for us, that means that God is king and any appointed or elected leader is secondary and only has the authority to rule as long as they are following the will of God. The U.S. government is based on a Presbyterian form of government for good and for bad. Think the Senate and you have elders. Think the House of Representatives and you have deacons. And committees, <coughs> Presbyterians, we love a committee, don't we? But this idea of freedom planted in the hearts of humankind from the beginning by God, celebrated and encouraged in Scripture, has roots long before 1776. Thomas Jefferson began writing the Declaration of Independence, holed up in a rented boarding room in Philadelphia on June 11th of 1776. He edited his own work many, many times, and then he shared a clean draft of his work with John Adams and Benjamin Franklin. And next, the document went to a committee, see, Presbyterians, a committee of five. John Adams of Massachusetts, who was calling for a severe independent break, Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, and Robert Livingston of New York. Finally, the committee shared it with the Continental Congress. Adams, Franklin, and the other members of the committee of five made 47 changes, including the addition of three whole new paragraphs. They presented that document to the Congress on June 28, 1776. Congress reviewed the document over several days, even after the body officially voted for independence on July 2nd, it continued to tweak it. Jefferson's draft continued to have more than 39 additional revisions. By the end of the debate, Congress had significantly altered Jefferson's original document, and on July 4th, 1776, Congress officially adopted the Declaration of Independence. 
as the delegates signed the document, which, by the way, John Hancock signed first, that famous large signature. And the legend is said that when Hancock signed it, he knew that King George was nearsighted and that he signed it so large, he turned to the rest of the delegates and said, there, I have signed my, na my name so large that the king can read it and can double the price on my head. A bold statement, a severe reality. It is said that Franklin said, we must indeed all hang together or most assuredly, we shall all hang separately. In an op-ed piece this week, Scott Douglas Gerber, a law professor at Ohio Northern University and an associate scholar at Brown University's Political Theory Project, who himself has published several books, writes about this day. He said, every American school child is taught that the Declaration of Independence was published on July 4th, 1776 that it proclaims that all men, all people are created equal and that we are endowed by our creator with the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Although the declaration further decrees that these same truths are self-evident. Historians have been disagreeing for generations about what the declaration actually means. The most famous book about, about America's founding document is Carl Becker's 1922 classic, The Declaration of Independence. In it, he says that the Declaration really formalizes and memorializes the political ideas of John Locke, an English philosopher and physician. But Gary Wills won the National Book Critics Award in 1978 for his book, Inventing America, Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, a book that contended the opposite of what Becker had argued. Wills insisted that Scottish moral philosophy, not Lockean liberalism, was at the heart of the Declaration. The Scots emphasized virtue while Locke stressed rights. Consequently, Wills maintained the Declaration stood as a conscious and deliberate distance from Locke's political principles. The author closes the article as he encourages everyone to remember that Freedom alone is not the supreme virtue in the Declaration. Equality matters too. I was talking with my friend Rusty Douglas in the weeks before I took a little time off and did a wedding down in Bluffton, South Carolina, and Rusty filled this pulpit two weeks ago. And we were on the phone talking, catching up on families, his kids, our kids, what they were doing. And in that, the conversation came up that our daughter Ellison is now engaged and planning her wedding, depending on travel restrictions, next March in Arbroath, Scotland. Now, how she picked Arbroath, Scotland, I'm not real sure. Originally, it was maybe going to be in Spain. Her fiancé's family has a place there. And then the issue of travel and how far you had to drive after you got there and language and Lyndall having a, a young child. There was this sense of, well, we like Scotland. We're Presbyterians. She started searching and she found this little castle, manor house. This big house that wasn't too unreasonable in the price that based on a minister's financial planning and commitment to three daughters she can do as long as she's careful with the rest of her budget because you got to do the same for each girl's they keep records they keep <laughs> really good records so she's booked this house outside of Arbroath, this beautiful house and i said to rusty that you know ellison's getting married maybe you can fill in for me next march because she's going to get married in scotland he said where in scotland and i said Arbroath. it's a a little town just north of Dundee, just south of Aberdeen. He said, I know Arbroath. I said, you do? He said, oh, I know Arbroath well. Some really important stuff happened in Arbroath. There was the Arbroath Declaration. You know that. I said, I don't. He said, you need to look it up. It's important stuff. It impacts the Magna Carta. It impacts the Declaration of Independence. So I did. I looked it up. The Declaration of Arbroath is the name usually given to the letter dated 6 April 1320 at Arbroath. And not just Arbroath, but at the Abbey in Arbroath. So the church in Arbroath. And it is about 
uh, a political discussion and a disagreement with the, co the Pope excommunicating King Robert. And with that, this letter, this document signed by the great men and the nobles of Scotland that declares the antiquity of the independence of the kingdom of Scotland and it denounces funny, it's the same bad guy again, English attempts to subjugate it. The declaration was intended to assert Scotland's status as an independent sovereign state and defend Scotland's right to use military action when unjustly attacked. It is said that while the Greeks gave us democracy, the Scots gave us the desire for the people to choose their leaders. Some have interpreted this point to maybe be the earliest known expression of popular sovereignty. That government is contractual and that rulers can be chosen by the community. It has been considered the first statement of the contractual theory of monarchy underlying modern day constitutional government. All that said, another friend sent me an email this week and it was one I'd seen but one I'd forgotten. And it kind of really fit with today and touched me and there were aha moments and then of course anything you get on the internet, especially anything that begins with somebody saying, this has been around a lot but it's still good. You wanna find out is it <coughs> true. Because not everything on the internet is true. You do know that, right? Not everything. On, if you take away one thing from the sermon today, not everything on the internet is true. So I went through, I researched, I tossed away the ones who were not true. So if you have heard this in the context, you will realize some of them are not accurate. But these are true. JFK Secretary of State Dean Rusk in his autobiography wrote that he was in France in the early 1960s when Charles de Gaulle decided to pull out of NATO. De Gaulle said he wanted all U.S. military out of France as soon as possible. Rusk responded, does that include those who are buried here? The email says you could have heard a pin drop. De Gaulle did not respond. When in England, during an address to the World Economic Forum in 2003, Colin Powell was asked by the Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, if the United States plans for Iraq were just an example of empire building by George Bush. He answered by saying, over the years, the United States has sent many of its finest young men and women into great peril to fight for freedom beyond our borders. The only amount of land we have ever asked for in return is enough to bury those that did not return. Again, you could have heard a pin drop. I researched both of these quotes to verify that they were factual, and they were. Rusk said that story in his autobiography. There were a couple others that were not true or unverified or just folklore or myth. Patriotic embellishments. That's why several of the stories in the list aren't included here, as I couldn't verify them or found them to actually be false. The comment by Colin Powell I found was true, but was a bit simplified. And the actual longer answer was even better. See, the Archbishop of Canterbury, after a speech given by Colin Powell, did ask the following question. And would you not agree, as a very significant political figure in the United States, Colin, that America at the present time is in danger of relying too much upon the hard power and not enough upon building the trust from which the soft values, which of course all of our family, family life that actually at the bottom, when the bottom line is reached, is what makes human life valuable. Secretary Powell paused and delivered a lengthy response to the former Archbishop's question. In the midst of that is the line that I quoted you, but there is so much more there. Secretary Powell said, the United States believes strongly in what you call soft power, the value of democracy, the value of the free economic system, the value of making sure that each citizen is free and free to pursue their own God-given ambitions and to use the talents that they were given by God. And that is what we say to the rest of the world. 
That is why we participated in establishing a community of democracy within the Western Hemisphere. It is why we participate in all of these great international organizations. There is nothing in, Amer in the American experience or in American political life or in our culture that suggests we don't <coughs> want to use hard power. But we have found over the decades is that unless you do have hard power, and here I think you're referring to military power, then sometimes you are faced with situations you can't deal with. I mean, it was not soft power that freed Europe. It was hard power. And what followed immediately after hard power? Did the United States ask for dominion over a single nation in Europe? No. Soft power came in the Marshall Plan. Soft power came with American GIs who put their weapons down once the war was over and helped all of those nations rebuild. We did the same thing in Japan. So our record of living our values and letting our values be an inspiration to others, I think, is clear. And I don't think I have anything to be ashamed of or apologize for with, with respect to what America has done in the world. The room broke out in applause. Secretary Powell went on to say, we have gone forth from our shores repeatedly over the last hundred years. We have done this as recently as the last year in Afghanistan and put wonderful young men and women at risk, many of whom have lost their lives, and we have asked for nothing except enough ground to bury them. And otherwise, we have returned home to seek our own, you know, to seek our own lives in peace, to live our own lives in peace, but there comes a time when soft power or talking with evil will not work. Unfortunately, hard power sometimes is the only thing that does. In 1998, former Majority Leader Trent Lott, a Presbyterian elder and member of First Presbyterian Church in Pascagoula, Mississippi, succeeded in instituting an annual National Tartan Day. April 6th is officially National Tartan Day. By resolution of the United States Senate, Resolution 155 on the 10th of November 1997 states that the Declaration of Arbroath, the Scottish Declaration of Independence, was signed on April 6th, 1320, and the American Declaration of Independence was modeled <coughs> on that inspirational document. I would argue there is a document that is older, a document that has inspired all of those great documents. As Galatians 5, 1 and 5, 13 and 14 says, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become servants to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Be free and go in peace by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn is God Bless America. The words, in case you don't know them, are printed in your bulletin.
signers of the Declaration of Independence, the majority of the signers were Church of England, Episcopalian. The next largest group were Presbyterians, and then Congregationalists, or in other words, Calvinists with a congregational form of government. Eight signers of the Declaration of Independence had been ministers at some point in their life, but only one was currently serving as a minister. And that person educated about 15 of our founding fathers around his dining room table as he started a college which you know today as Princeton University. That signer was the Reverend John Witherspoon, a Scottish immigrant to America and a Presbyterian minister. This country is made of great ideas founded on the principle of freedom that we have found in faith and faith alone. That great song we just sang was, was written by a Jewish immigrant from Russia who served in World War I named Irvin Berlin. We live in the land of the free and the home of the brave by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Now may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may the grace of Jesus Christ, may the love of God be with you and upon you all, both now and forevermore. Amen. <coughs>